All right, the next thing we'll look at is what's called sometimes motional EMF. So let's say I've got a lovely conducting rod here, like a metal rod. So, and it's moving in an area where there's a uniform magnetic field pointing into the board. So as this thing's moving, it has lovely little mobile charges in here. What are the real mobile charges in this conductor? Electrons. And so in this case, those electrons are gonna feel, because of the velocity here, they're gonna feel a magnetic force. So in this case, we learned that, you know, force equals QVB sine theta, things of a sort. The question is, I wanna know what direction is that force gonna be? So you recall the right-hand rule associated with that guy? So where do I need to point my fingers? Fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. Where do I point my thumb? Direction of the velocity, and the force comes out your palm for a positive charge, which means a negative charge would actually be going in the opposite direction. And so what we find out is that electrons are really gonna travel this direction. So, and as long as, you know, for the time they travel, it's kind of like a current. If we looked at this as more conventional current, we could look at the imaginary positive charges moving to the top, whatever. All I know is that electrons are gonna start pooling up down here at the bottom. And because they left the top, that's gonna leave a positive charge at the top. And if you look here, with a net positive charge at the top and a net negative charge down at the bottom here, there's an EMF. So a voltage here, if you will, in this lovely conducting rod. If I were a free-floating positive charge, where would I go just due to the electric field that's been created in this rod? If I was a free-floating positive charge right here. I'd want to go down, propelled by the positive, attracted to the negative. So and we can look at that as a potential difference, an EMF in this case. Are you cool with that? So just a motion, you know, charge, uh, a conducting bar in this case, in motion in a constant magnetic field will have an EMF associated with it. So I've experienced this, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any canal path between Guadalupe and Elliot. So they have these big, lovely, huge power lines going over it. Big, lovely, huge power lines. I don't know how much current they have. They're not supposed to have a ton of current. They just have a huge potential across them, but they must have enough current because they generate an actual pretty significant magnetic field at the ground. How do I know this? Because when I ride my metal bicycle, so with a nice long metal rod going across it for handlebars, so if I'm touching the rubber grips, I'm fine, but if two parts of my body touch the metal, I get shocked <laughs> as I'm riding under this thing and it's the motional EMF due to the magnetic field created by the power lines. Good times. So same kind of thing going on there. So it all, notice it depends on what direction I'm traveling and things of a sort, and what parts of the bike I'm touching and, and all this stuff. And like I said, I don't think they're supposed to have a ton of current in them, but it must be enough to generate enough of a magnetic field that I'm getting shocked while riding my bicycle under them. Cool, same kind of thing here. If you notice, let's just say I connected the ends of this thing to a circuit. And let's just say, you know, let's even look at this a little different. Let's say I want this thing to be able to travel, so I just hook it up. And this thing's got a couple of holes in this that run all the way through. And so it can just slide along the wires here, keeping contact with it the entire time. And so we end up with a complete circuit. And so the question is, now that I've got a complete circuit, I don't just get a buildup of charges at the ends of the rod anymore. I actually get a current flowing through the circuit. And so in this case, the current flowing through the circuit, which way is it gonna go? And when I say current, unless I say the electrons, what do I actually mean by current? conventional current, imaginary flow of positive charges in this case, which way are they gonna flow? In this circuit here, clockwise or counterclockwise? Yeah, they're gonna go counterclockwise. I can see my positive charges imaginarily flowing, so in this case, counterclockwise. So if I said what direction is the current, you should say counterclockwise. If I say what's the direction of the flow of electrons, well then you'd say clockwise. So be careful with that. We usually ask for conventional current, not the flow of electrons, but in principle, they could ask it either way. Cool. And in this case, we've got another situation where we've generated an induced current. 
And we could actually look at this from the perspective of uh, Faraday's law again and figure out what, you know, the induced EMF in this lovely system is going to be and stuff like that. So, and in this case, if you look at flux again, what part of my magnetic flux here is changing that's causing this resulting induced EMF? Is the magnetic field strength changing? Is the area of my loop changing? Yes. As the bar moves to the right, the loop gets bigger. So I move the bar to the left, the loop would get smaller and stuff like that. So yeah, it actually is the area of the loop that's actually changing. I'm not rotating it, so theta is not changing. In this case, I've oriented the loop and the magnetic field to be perpendicular, so theta is zero. It's just the area that's actually changing. And so because I have a changing flux, I get an induced EMF. Now, if we look at one other thing here, so let's go back to this not being connected to a complete circuit here for a second. Cool, so it was the magnetic field here, so, and a magnetic force that caused this separation of charges. Is it gonna be an infinite buildup of charges? Well, I hope not, that'd be a little bit strange. So it's not gonna be infinite because as the charges separate, why don't we wanna just keep separating? what's growing that's going to prevent just infinite amount of charge going to each side besides the fact that there's only a certain number of charges in the rod but what else is actually going to oppose it well do more negative charges really want to flow down here no what's opposing them yeah now there's a coulombic force of repulsion here so that's going to be repelling it and stuff like that uh, and in this case, so the magnetic force that causes this, at some point when these charges build up big enough, will exactly equal the electric force that's now opposing it. And so, and from that, that's where the last equation comes from. You can figure out, if you rearrange some terms, that your EMF induced is actually equal to the strength of the magnetic field. So the length of your rod and the velocity at which it's moving. You could figure this out from Faraday's law as well if you wanted to. If we look at Faraday's law, so if we assume that we just look at a single loop, we'll get rid of that, make that a one. So in this case, what part of the flux are we actually changing? The B, the A, or the theta? So as we move this lovely bar down the stretch here. What, so assuming again we now have a complete loop again. So we're changing the area again. So, and in this case, we've oriented the theta, to, we've oriented our loop to be perfectly perpendicular, so our theta is zero and cosine of zero is one. So I'm gonna have that go away. It's just equal to one. And so our change in flux here is just gonna be B times the change in the area. All over the change in time. Now, if we look here, we've defined the length of our rod as L here in our original equation here. So in this case, how do we define the area of this loop? Well, it's L times some distance here, right? So in this case, is the L part of my area changing? No, but is this distance right here changing? Yeah, I'm just gonna call this X and how fast it changes, I'm gonna call delta X. And so my change area could be looked at as length times that change in X all over the change in time. But what's change in X over change in time? Velocity, and that's where we get this lovely equation from right here. Cool, so we just demonstrated where this comes from, from Gauss, or not Gauss law, from Faraday's law. So, but you could also derive it from setting the magnetic force equal to the electric force opposing it at some point. Cool. So technically I've given you this equation, but it's really, if you 
just memorize Faraday's law, you can derive the exact result from Faraday's law. Cool. So let's go back and look at this one more time. So as I move this lovely bar to the right, so first of all, which direction does the flux point relative to my loop here? Which direction is the flux point? Well, same direction as the field. Which way is the field point? And the boards. So here my flux points into the board. As I move this bar over, are the number of field lines passing through my loop growing or shrinking? Growing. So my flux points into the board and it's growing. So my change in flux points into the board. That's what I need to oppose according to Lenz's law. So I need to generate a current that results in a magnetic field pointing out of the board, which means it's going to flow counterclockwise. What we already discovered just by looking at the positive and negative charges and the effect of the magnetic field on them. We can also figure out the same thing using Lenz's law here. Questions? Cool. That's all I got for you tonight. So Lenz's law gives people fits. People have a tough time seeing the difference between magnetic flux and the change in magnetic flux. If I relate velocity to change in velocity, it's usually the best bet, but some students still just struggle with this. So if you end up being one of those, just practice, practice, practice. It does take some getting used to. But the big deal is that you can figure out which way your flux points, the same direction as the field typically. The question is just increasing or decreasing.